Dear ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you and welcome to the panel uh, session, The Blessed and the Cursed. So I'm pretty happy and really honored to have all these fine gentlemen here as the panelists, uh, since we will be today discussing about four markets that Maria adequately addressed, those who were directly or indirectly in the position to be troubled in one or another way. So today we will be talking about Greece, about Georgia, about Iran, and about Russia. But just before we start the, the, the round table, the, the panel discussion, I would just really like to use a few minutes to um, set the scene and to give just basic overview of each of those four markets that we will tackle on during today. So first, starting with the Greece, we have obviously the country that, um, that was very troubled in the period from 2009 to 2012, obviously due to social unrest, economic crisis, and all unfortunate events that were happening over there. But we can see that over the last three recent years, the, the situation completely changed. So just in three years, they have managed to attract eight additional million of in international foreign arrivals. So quite substantial success for the Greek tourism sector. Um, but at the same time, we have seen that not all destinations have recovered very quickly. Uh, so obviously there is on national level upward trend, but there are actually three universes in terms of destinations, in, in, in terms of their ability and readiness to get back on the market. So firstly, we have um, fully international destinations, meaning those who were dominantly oriented towards international arrivals, and they actually have been doing pretty well over the last three years. So they increased from 7.5 million international arrivals to over 12 million international arrivals over three years. So here we really speak about full recovery and further growth. Then we come to capital, national capital, Athens. So the, the, obviously the, the, the capital city was suffering very much until 2012. But later from 2012, leisure market improved substantially. But there is still the gap in terms of attracting mice business. So the mice business has not come to Athens yet. And then we have the third group of destinations being domestic oriented destinations. So these destinations are still suffering a lot. So um, the, the, the expenditures on tourism have increased, have decreased actually for 67%. So those destinations who were relying on domestic travelers are still suffering and still did not recover at all. Additionally, there have been some arguments that, um, that national marketing system is not quite efficient as sector would like to be. And consequently, uh, at the moment, we see that Greece is still not came back in terms of attractive investment destination. So, so far until 2020, we see the, the investment pipeline of hotels to be just a little bit over 200 million American dollars. So for such strong touristic country, um, on the European level, this is kind of very, very moderate investment pipeline. Skipping to Georgia, um, we can see that the consistent upward trend of international arrivals uh, and those international arrivals at the moment form up to 80% of the all arrivals in the country. Um, and it is interesting to say that um, Georgia is among the world's countries, best countries in terms of growth of international arrivals. Uh, so on annually, they have on average a grew for 24% from 2007 to 2015. Um, also due to its geographical variety, they are really, besides of currently very strong product of being sun and beach, uh, and also uh, business tourism, the government and the authorities and the private players are also now very, uh, working very hard on development of new touristic products, being dominantly wine tourism, also focusing very much on, on city tourism, but also government investing a lot in ski infrastructure and active adventure outdoor products. So we will also talk about this. And um, all of this has been also recognized by domestic and international investors. So we can see at the moment that Georgia is very hot in terms of hotel investment pipeline. 
So at the moment, until 2020, we see that uh, investment uh, volume is uh, estimated around $300 million, which is $100 million more than, for instance, compared to Greece for the same period of, of time. So we can really see that Georgia is getting under the highlight and really trying to build up its space on international tourism, global tourism market. Skip, skipping to Iran, we are really tackling one interesting market. Uh, and it is really unquestionable that Iran is at the moment one of the most potent touristic destinations globally. We are speaking of the country with 21 UNESCO World Heritage Sites. We are speaking of the country with almost 80 million population. And um, already Iran is considered to be one of the most attractive countries in Middle East and North Africa region. So in the recent years, as you can see, they have recorded strong growth of foreign arrivals. It's a 12% on average. And this is additionally supported uh, through new airlifts connections with major European cities and major European airlines. So all of this is going to additionally influence the importance and the position of the Iran on the global touristic market. Uh, Iranian government also recognized tourism as an important tool for development and for internationalization. So they have been really started to opening up towards foreign investors, foreign brands. It's going slowly, but it is going. And uh, so just recently, Iran saw the first international hotel and tourism investment conference. Uh, it was a huge hit. A lot of international players came over to see what's possible, how to do the business in Iran. So this is just going to develop even more and more over the years we, we see. And currently, we see quite narrow hotel pipeline in terms of investments. Uh, but however, it's most intri intriguing market at the moment, probably, globally. And all of the hotel companies and a lot of investors are trying to see and to assess how to address and how to enter this market. So it's going to be also interesting to discuss a few points with, with our panelists also on the topic of Iran. And then finally, skipping to Russia, we can see that due to sanctions, rubble depreciation and also political issues, foreign arrivals um, have been decreased in 2015. Uh, and also significant drop of international tourism receipts. Have, oh, no, 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 it was the increase of, but yeah, S decreasing. Yeah. So it was increased, but uh, in terms of uh, tourism receipts, they actually decreased. So in this respect, Russians have been increasingly traveling to um, domestic destinations. Europe was not in their focus, is not in their focus recently at all due to rubble depreciation. Europe has become extremely expensive destinations for Russian travelers. And on the same side, we have the travel bans that were valid towards the Turkey and towards the Egypt over last year. Although some of these bans have been lifted so far, but they have strongly influenced the, 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 the national situation in Russia and the, the scope of, of travels of Russian market. Also with international sports events like Confederation Cup this year and also the FIFA World Cup um, um, in 2018, we have seen the increasing development trends uh, for hotels. And in that sense, we can see that Russia, among all the countries that we will discuss and tackle today, has actually the biggest pipeline of hotel development. It's worth, until 2020, 3 billion Amer American dollars. So it's quite substantial goal to achieve. So thank you very much. I think uh, I gave some kind of rough overview of what we could talk today about. So maybe, um, I don't know, any preferences who want to start the first? Okay, so maybe Dr. Aris Ikos, please, can you, can you give us some kind of general overview of current situation of Greek tourism? What's happening? Who is developing? Who is still in, in trouble? And what's happening with the ADRs, with the occupancy levels, etc., etc.? Okay. Um, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I think, as you rightly said, pointed out, Sinisa, the, um, the Greek market is split in three types of markets, the international destinations, destinations 
which have done quite well over the years. Uh, Sinisa gave some figures. Uh, Athens, which after the social and political unrest of the years 2008-2012 um, recovered and has recovered spectacularly actually, but only in the leisure market. And then the destinations that depend on the domestic market, which have taken a hard hit to give you one, ex one figure. Tourism spent by the Greeks uh, in 2008 was at 3.8 billion. Now it is around 1.2 billion. So you understand that this is a massive hit. Now, um, there are a number of investments taking place in Athens. Uh, there's a new hotel opened by a Greek chain, Electra, with 265 rooms or something. Uh, Windham opened its first hotel, similar type of size. Uh, Marriott is coming back to the city, uh, rebranding another hotel. So I think there is, a, there is activity in Athens and we expect this to continue. In any case, we expect that this activity will, be, will take a step increase uh, if and when. Uh, the issue of uh, Greek, Greece exiting the Euro ends because we think that has uh, a major uncertainty factor plus a higher interest rate. So once this factor goes away, we expect that this uh, will, will reverse. Uh, regarding the islands, can I ask you, Sinisa, the, the figure you showed of the 250 are from, is from international databases. Yes. Okay. We believe, we have evidence actually, that the investment is considerably higher than 250, mm -hmm. but that investment takes place by local owner-operated hotels, so it never enters international databases. And because the Greek uh, market is very much owner-operated, so you don't get that information. And our estimates uh, for 2014, we're working now on the 2015 data, is that hotel investment, including renovations, was close to 800 uh, million. million. So if you consider the economic situation of Greece and the risks, etc., I think this is a very strong uh, figure. Um, going forward, uh, <coughs> tourism flows for 2017 seem very good. All the messages that we get are extremely positive. We think that has to do, one, with the, with, the, with the good quality of the Greek tourism product. People come, have a good time, uh, have fun, and then they go back happy. Plus, it also has to do with the instability of the region and with a number of markets, Turkey, Northern Africa, being uh, out uh, of the market. I don't know, have I answered your question? Yes, yes, Thank yes, you. absolutely. So, um, Omer, uh, speaking of Iran, uh, some, some probably might think that you are brave or that maybe you are crazy. But can you tell us what is your opinion about Iran? So obviously you have interest for Iran. Yep. You have something probably you can share with, with, uh, with the audience, uh, your plans for Iran. Yep. What's, what's, what's in it for you? Yep. And how do you see Iranian market in general? Is it now a good time to enter or is it maybe too... Mature, see if, I can mature? if I can remember all of those questions at the same time. But I'll start uh, by, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sinisa. I think, uh, what do I think of Iran? Uh, Iran uh, is, a, is a new frontier in terms of the hospitality segment. Um, it's in, our, in the area where Rotana operates predominantly, which is the Middle East, North Africa. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a country that has had nearly 40 years of dormancy in terms of the hospitality. So there's so many reasons why Iran can be successful and for operators in our industry to get in there and do business. Um, we're very excited about Iran. We've been trying to do business in, since 2011. We've been successful with signing uh, six management agreements and the first hotel should open up by the end of this year. Uh, latest, let's say, Q1 of uh, 2018. But of course, uh, uh, with every new frontier, there are gonna be challenges. Um, considering that there's very few hotels there today, and no classification system, and no hospitality education. Um, I, I think the number that I read on the, on the, on the slide was 3,000 hotels, but the number that I have is about 1,200 hotels that they have in Iran. Um, and in, in, uh, just for the sake of comparison, in the UAE there are nearly 1,000 hotels. The UAE has a total population of 9.3 million, whereas there's 18 million people 
in, uh, in, in, in Iran. In Iran. Yeah. So, uh, which means there's a long way, a lot to do, and uh, getting in there in the early stages of a frontier nation in our business, I think is something extremely exciting. But there will be challenges, uh, like there are in every city or in every country. Um, and you've got to go into Iran with your eyes wide open and uh, you know, hit those challenges one by one and overcome them. But being first on the ground, um, although we're not first on the ground in terms of operating, Accor have come in and they've opened up, uh, or will open up, a Novotel Hotel and an Ibis. Yeah. But we should be the second hotel chain to open up uh, by the end of the year. And also so. Melia, there is Melia. Melia will open yeah. up on the Caspian as well. So, yeah, um, very exciting times, amazing to be part of a new frontier uh, uh, industry platform, and uh, we're very, very excited. Well, c considering political situation and some kind of, you know, the, 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 the tensions, do you think regarding scenario of development of hotels <coughs> in, in an entrance of foreign brands, do you think it's going to happen very quickly, yeah. over the night, let's say it, or you, you rather see it as kind of slow paced due to different other obstacles? I think uh, I was a part of the conference that you mentioned uh, last month in Tehran, and uh, uh, in all honesty, the mood of the investors and the mood of the hotel chains and the, the local government was so buoyant, was so strong. Everybody just wants to get onto that development train and start um, pushing the industry forward. Um, but, and, and talking to a lot of uh, investors, whether foreign or domestic, you know, with the lifting of the sanctions, there are seven countries um, other than the US, which is the eighth country, that is already investing into Tehran yes. and to Iran and other major cities around the, the area. Um, so those seven countries are very committed. But talking to the local Iranians, there's always the issue of what about if something happens through the US, which in my opinion has slightly dulled the, the vibrant atmosphere of development um, in the country. But, like I said, already hundreds of millions of dollars have been invested, more to come, and I think the Iranians are really going to forge forward to try to reach their vision of having, you know, by 2025, 20 million uh, tourists. Yeah. That, that yeah. is quite, quite that's a, that's optimistic. That's a big jump mm -hmm. from five challenge, now, yeah. from five today, so that's a long way to go. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you think it's going to be rather quick change, considering all these kind of I think if there's a little bit more clarity, uh, Sunisa, on the issue of where America stands in the big picture of the world, and let's not get political here, I think if that's cleared up a little bit, I think the speed will reach the necessary level in order to reach the targets that they're setting. Yeah. Okay. Because as you said, we're already seeing double-digit growth for the past three to four years, and that's before the sanctions were lifted. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, speaking of, of, of big development and big changes, obviously we cannot overlook Georgia. So, Georgi, um, over the last, let's say, five years, number of international hotels have dramatically increased. Georgia, from, let's say, in situation 2000, before 2009, there were just, uh, let's say, three international branded hotels. In the pipeline now, we really have all sorts of hotel brands entering into the Georgia. So what's happening with Georgia? How come you, you become so, so big hit? Uh, What's happening, it's a good question, because we are increasing year by year in the number of tourists. Uh, for example, the last year, 2016, was record-breaking year for Georgia, and uh, we reached 6.3 uh, international visitors. Uh, if you take in mind that the population of Georgia is just 3.7 million, it's nearly the double of the population that we are receiving as a tourist. And uh, this uh, tend, uh, trend is uh, increasing year by year. Uh, beginning of 2017 was 32% increase in January only, if you compare with the same period of the last year. Uh, and this is uh, observed uh, by the international hotel chains, and, and there are many uh, home projects on the pipeline. Uh, Intercontinental is coming there. <coughs> Um, uh, and many other hotels. And what is interesting is that Georgia is also developing its own brands, which are becoming more and po more popular. And at the end, it means that uh, we as a government are investing uh, heavily in the general infrastructure, also in, in, in the capital, but also in the different resorts. And uh, private sector, in this case, investors, local and international investors are doing the uh, big projects. 
about 1 billion Georgian lari, which is more than 300 million USD, will be investing, invested in hospitality and uh, special hotel projects within next years in Georgia. Um, we are trying to promote and support the uh, hotel development in the country, and we uh, developed the special programs which to stimulate and co-finance the uh, hotel uh, uh, development in the country. For example, we have a special project which stimulates um, the development of the hotels. And uh, I tell you the one component, if the investor will decide to make uh, an international chain on his, uh, uh, on his project, uh, he uh, will get the 50% uh, co-financing within the first two years on the franchise fee that he has to pay to the international chain. So we did it because we believe that it will be easier for us uh, to sell the country if we have um, as many international hotel names there as possible. And also it helps us to get the better uh, standards, international standards, because with a big name, uh, with the international chain hotel, uh, there is a big box of the standards of different different uh, type of standards. So uh, we do appreciate all kind of investment in this field, and we support it very much. That is interesting. That's very nice. I oh. think the, the the our yeah we want to sign up. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we, we want in. Yeah, maybe there in. is possibility sign to sign the contract <laughs> immediately. Yeah. Back to the, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so Walter. You, you, you are covering the, the, you are coming from the country that covers and is situated on both continents. So probably if I ask you how, with all the political tensions and section, uh, sanctions and the rubble depreciations, uh, hitting actually the, the record low at the moment, uh, what is the happening with Russian tourism and hotel industry? Probably the, the answer is not so easy, but anyway, I'm going to ask you that, sorry. <laughs> Actually, the ruble has improved quite dramatically. Uh, it's not any more record low. We are now, uh, we have been a year ago, one uh, 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 euro and 85 rubles. Now it's 62. So in the meantime, yeah. actually the country ha has, after the first shocks uh, of the sanctions in 2014, which a lot of people did not come uh, to Russia from abroad, what your figure shows as well. Mm -hmm. But you, you'd finished your charge with 2015. 2016 was already quite um, uh, a change. Because with the devaluation of the ruble, a lot of uh, people suddenly realized that Russia is a country which you can afford. In former times, we had always the rep reputation Russia has an extremely expensive uh, hotel uh, accommodation prices, which is in the meantime not any longer. Mm. Actually, uh, Russia, or Moscow, let's say, was in 2014 under the top 10 most expensive cities in the world. 2015, we were 48. 2016, we are not anymore on the list. So it's a, it's a, a product at the, in the meantime, which is affordable for the West. And when we lost a lot of people are, uh, coming from the Western countries, uh, Russia was smart enough as well that uh, we have converted our interests as well to the East. In the meantime, uh, the Chinese market, the Iranian market, and as well the Indian market is quite an important market for Russia. Mm. Alone, uh, our company, Azimut, in the year 2014, with around 26,000 room nuts from uh, the Chinese market. In the meantime, we are over 100,000. Mm. So quite okay. a dramatic uh, change in, <coughs> in that matter. So are we suffering under the sanctions? Are we suffering uh, uh, as well under uh, the version of the rate? Not any longer. Actually, the Moscow market, uh, in the meantime, we have the same occupancy we had before. Hotels in Moscow are, uh, are running with an occupancy between 75 and 80 percent. We are still uh, as well uh, in the same ruble base we have been before. Yes, in comparison to what we had in, uh, converted uh, before in dollars or in, in euros, it's not anymore the same. <coughs> but as long as you're smart enough that your costs are as well in rubles, uh, uh, then it's not, not such a big uh, damage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we are coming as well now with the Confedera Confederation Cup in 2017 and then in 2018 with the FIFA uh, world uh, Championship in Russia, we will have a lot of new products coming on the market. Alone in Moscow, in the next 12 months, we have another 3,000 rooms uh, in the three- and four-star market. 
So quite substantial, and uh, we have as well that our government is helping as well that all these hotels will be open as well with all the permissions, with all the support uh, which we need, we are getting it uh, to open by ourselves. We are opening as well another 500 room hotel in Moscow uh, just in six weeks. So because we see there's a demand, there's a wish as well, and uh, I'm seeing actually quite a good future uh, for us. Like Iran, we're waiting uh, for some signs from Washington, <laughs> some positive signs uh, th uh, that after all of this talking, uh, which has been uh, taking care before the election, that now it is as well uh, coming up and it's bringing us a better relation uh, to the US. And then I think the, when the Western market is well starting to come stronger to Russia, it will be even much better than even before the uh, sanctions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Aris, um, maybe, uh, of course, there was a big crisis 2009-2012, but also some problems and some stones on the road over 2015. Again, slight, um, slight problems uh, internally, but also internally in terms of migration route uh, going through, through Greece, and, but at the same time, some other Mediterranean destinations having even worse times, like Egypt or, or Tunisia. So how did 2015 turn in terms of final balance? Obviously, there were pluses and minuses, but what, what, what happened? Was it kind of restructuring year for the, for the Greek tourism or, or not? I wouldn't say restructuring. I, I would say that uh, 2015 uh, started very badly with um, a very negative picture of Greece internationally and we saw this reflected in bookings which went diving in the first two or three months. Then as soon so it's as minus 20, minus 30 percent. Yeah, something like minus 20, minus 30 percent. Uh, it was one had to do with our uh, economic and political uh, troubles and non-negotiations uh, with our creditors in the first half of 2015. And the other uh, issue which we had, uh, sorry, and then, then we also had the migration crisis, but 2015 was mostly economic. Uh, then as soon as things started easing, there was a huge uh, rebound of bookings. Uh, and then in June 2015, we had the capital controls. Uh, as soon as the shock of the capital controls was over and an agreement was reached two or three weeks later, uh, there was a huge rebound and to actually 2015 ended up being the record year in terms of revenues. Um, then, if I may continue on 2016, because I think that completes yeah, sure, the picture. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. Okay, then 2016, uh, we had in the first half problems again with the creditors and uh, and also then we also had much uh, important issues with the migration having built up during 2015 mm -hmm. and formed very Im various images now the migration issue has uh, affected very strongly the islands bordering on the turkish uh, on turkey uh, and they have had uh, declines of between <coughs> 10 or 12 percent on Kos, which is a major destination, up to 50 percent or more in uh, the island of uh, Lesbos, which is a, a, my, a less important destination. 2016, despite this, or perhaps because of also helped by the uh, social and political unrest in the East Med, was a record year in, um, in terms of arrivals, but we saw, uh, we saw revenues going down. I can give you a rational explanation and a conspiracy theory. I'll give you both. The rational explanation is we've seen uh, average spend per visitor falling across the Mediterranean. Uh, we have seen that from the UNWTO data. And because Greece entered late into the market because of the financial and migration problems, uh, the hotels offered uh, heavy discounts uh, last-minute booking, so that pulled, we think, the whole uh, uh, revenue down. Although, funnily enough, the hotels had a very good performance in 2016, but probably the, um, the combination of uh, perception of security and no real issue of security 
and the last minute pulling perhaps a, a lower spend market, there was not much spending outside uh, of hotels. Uh, and uh, if you want to move to the conspiracy theory of what, why this uh, happened, why revenues dropped, this is that during 2015, people fearing about capital controls came with their pockets full of cash. So when, because the, the amount of spending is done through a survey when you leave the country, if you're asked how much did you spend, you know exactly how much you spent if you had cash in your pocket, but not so well if you paid by credit card and you find the bill uh, a month or two later, which was the case in 2016. You can pick your own explanation. <laughs> <laughs> but we, the signs for 2017 are positive and we think that the average spend uh, will recover at least partly. Uh, and the average spent, sorry, that was another factor, because of the US travelers, which are important in terms of revenue in Greece, the US travelers stayed away from Europe uh, long 2016. We think that also played uh, a role in that, in mm -hmm. dropping of revenue. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, uh, Omer, mm, I remember, obviously, both you have been probably even more than me in Iran over the last years. But I remember that wherever I go, hotels are full. In cases of some big conferences, it's quite impossible to find a proper room, even if it's hotel old 10 or 15 or 20 years. Um, so can, can you maybe share with the, with the audience what is current state of the art in terms of hotel performances uh, in Iran? That's a very difficult question because in Iran there aren't any uh, official statistics uh, in any way, shape or form. So what you're depending on is what uh, you're hearing from certain hotel consultants and what the, the government uh, are telling you. So uh, it's really not very reliable in terms of what occupancies they were running at uh, annually, ADRs, REVPARs, um, uh, seasonalities versus 15, 14, 13. So it's very difficult. But uh, w one, one thing that is for sure, and I, and I can't really give you a number, other than what I heard when I was there in March, is that uh, last year uh, the, the occupancy has jumped uh, from 15 to 16, from an average occupancy of around 52 to 55 percent to about 80 percent uh, through Tehran. I'm focusing on Tehran yeah. here, and Tehran obviously has the highest occupancies in, in Iran, and then followed by Mashhad and uh, the likes of Shiraz, Tabriz, and Esfahan. So we really aren't, aren't talking about anything that, that we really know. So the likes of SDR are not helping us. Uh, hopefully one day they will. Um, so what are we depending on what, we, what we're finding out? And the more hotels that come to Tehran and to the major cities and start opening and trading and talking with each other, I think we'll, we'll find out more and more. But the signs are since uh, uh, the, the lifting of the sanctions are that more and more people are coming, uh, more and more, um, and not, not just tourists, we're talking about business people from uh, from Korea, from China, from Japan, from the majority of Europe that is very active uh, in, uh, in, in Iran, um, you're seeing that, uh, you will see that the occupancies, I believe, are going to be r remaining in the, if not mid-80s, early 90s, um, from now until the next five or ten years. Um, the rates are fixed in, 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 in Iran, so there's, there's no real, you're not really able to yield on rates so far, but there is talk in the government that they're going to be allowing hotels to sell freely, uh, which, of course, is going to lift up the ADR and therefore the revenues coming into the hotels. But uh, very positive moving forward for so many reasons. So I think uh, uh, it, uh, we haven't even scratched the surface in terms of what could happen um, in terms of uh, uh, our business in, in, in Iran as a country. But then general feeling is that actually hotel KPIs should not be a problem. No. No, I don't think uh, the KPIs, in terms of what I mentioned, the occupancies, the REVPARs, the ADRs, um, I, don't, I think the profitabilities are going to be high. There's a, a very large uh, local labor force that are all dying to get into the hotel industry. The Iranians love to talk to people. Whenever, if they can speak a word of English, they're going to come up to you and say, can I talk to you because I want to express myself because I, there's nobody to talk to and, you know, and I want to learn from you. So um, it, it's positive in nearly every way and not just financial. Uh, yep. what, what our industry can do. Yeah, the whole uh, attitude and the you know, culture. The whole, the whole thing, the education aspect, the financial aspect, the, the social aspect. Um, it's quite incredulous what can happen uh, in, in that country over the next... Uh, so yes, very positive uh, about uh, how I see things moving forward. Perfect. And can you tell me about the, the, the investments? 
So uh, obviously you are signing the contracts over there, so you, you are working with the um, investors. Uh, what do you think in terms of local investors? We have been discussing just before. Yeah. Um, you, you said that this is kind of also one interesting point about the Iranian market, so that there are local investors. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the business that's happening today, the new hotels that are coming up today are from, you know, uh, very wealthy, well-to-do uh, Iranian business families. Um, uh, we're doing business with a guy who's a pis pistachio billionaire. And, they, you know, there's, you know it, it's, they've got lots of money uh, in their country that they are now starting to invest in their country. So the, our hotels are all with uh, local investors who are coming up with the money themselves. We have signed pure management agreements with them, no leases and no equity required. Um, although there are many that have the plot of land and don't have the money to spend to. So I th I, it kind of like really depends on who you're going to, uh, to business with um, uh, in Iran. But uh, the majority of what's happening today, in our case and in many other cases, is coming from uh, local investors. Okay. Okay. Well, speaking of investments, uh, George just mentioned in his previous uh, uh, discussion that uh, obviously Georgian government is paying a lot of attention to development of new touristic products. So <clears throat> I, there is a company who is working with you on the, on the ski, big mm -hmm. mega ski product development. So can you maybe share with, with the audience what's really happening with the ski product and this landmark project that you are now in the process of already implementation? Uh, one of the prior priority areas uh, to develop tourism in Georgia was identified as a skiing resorts. And um, we have at the moment four big uh, skiing resorts and all of them are equipped with German and French uh, high technology equipment like uh, Poma, company Poma and German technologies. So uh, we are heavily uh, investing in and we are investing millions, 100 millions of USD in the infrastructure projects. This allows um, the rest of the business uh, to see where government is going, what projects are priority, and to develop at the same time uh, the tourism infrastructure, including hotels, restaurants, and etc. So we find, uh, found uh, the right PPP format for public and private partnerships there. And the, if I uh, mention uh, how much was the international receipts in tourism, it exceeded 2 billion USD, which is a big number for Georgia. And um, uh, tourism share in GDP is up to 8%. So we continue to do the big projects, and uh, many local and international investors are uh, interested uh, to come up with the different uh, joint projects as well. And if I may add, there is also the, the big mega pro uh, project in Gudauri Ski. So, uh, if I'm not mistaken, around $150 million yes. for the, the, the new redevelopment plus the new development yeah, of the And again, ski we experience. have already the yeah, existing yeah. Investor, investors uh, with whom we found the formula that we do this kind of infrastructure projects and the uh, investor is ready uh, to do uh, the hotel development plans there. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, maybe Walter, so obviously Russians are heavily relying now on traveling within the Russia. Uh, can you maybe give us a short snapshot about, I don't know, St. Pete, Sochi, Moscow, what's Obviously, there were some, we were also discussing just before that a lot of people were saying that Sochi could be problematic after, mm -hmm. after the, 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 the Olympics. And then, in some mirac miraculous way, <laughs> things played out that now Sochi is star of touristic star in this part of the Europe. You know, actually, everybody was thinking after the, the Olympics that 30,000 new hotel beds in Sochi, 30,000 that, okay, how in hell we, w we are going to fill that up. <laughs> but honestly, sometimes as well, certain things happen and then uh, there are possibilities coming up and uh, all these sanctions, all these uh, problematics as well with Turkey, uh, as well where Russians did not travel anymore in summer, uh, as well Egypt, that has helped uh, Sochi enormously. Uh, last year was the best year ever Sochi uh, had. 
we were lucky as well we, because we have uh, had over th uh, three um, properties over there. One of the, uh, the biggest property in, uh, in Europe with 2,880 rooms mm -hmm. alone. And we were in the position because of all that coming up that we would increase our revenues by 120% in one year. And I think uh, it was not only good uh, management work, it was as well a lot of luck as well with all the incidents that happened. The Russians actually have been after they, they could travel uh, uh, in the 90s. They have been traveling a lot abroad, seeing the world and uh, uh, conquering the world in the many, many cases. Now suddenly, because of the currency exchange, uh, suddenly Europe, Asia, US became much too expensive. And suddenly uh, the Russians have found their own country back. Mm. Russia has 144 million people. That is quite a, uh, a good opportunity as well for hoteliers uh, to get the, uh, the people over their hotels. And when you consider that, for example, in Russia, presently we have only 120 uh, hotels which are internationally branded. That's nothing for a country yes. like Russia. So there are still huge opportunities as well. And uh, we are still, uh, everything has been in the 90s and the 2000s, St. Petersburg, Moscow. And then now suddenly it's spreading out as well over the country. We had uh, in 2016, we had a huge event in Ufa, the BRICS uh, conference, similar to the G20, uh, but simply with some other players on board. And uh, suddenly Ufa, where we have been the only international operator, in, a, in six weeks, suddenly we were one out of six. And the amount of rooms in, 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 in Ufa just uh, simply tripled. But still, as well, the, the market as well after, after that as well, uh, it gives a lot of opportunities for the local markets that are now coming using their hotels, getting acquainted as well with international as well with local brands. And the amount of uh, our Russian clients is permanently increasing. And that's good uh, for the country. It's good as well for new destinations as well. We are as well developing inside of the country now, uh, when I just think of, of Baikal, uh, the mm -hmm. Caucasian area as well. There's new places are coming up, which is uh, a quite uh, a good opportunity as well for the future. Okay, so not only those cities, major destinations, are kind of uh, in the hot, on, yeah. on the hot side, but also you see the, the emergence of and the rise of secondary destinations which were out of focus so far. Even destinations, let, let's say like uh, destinations like Vladivostok, mm -hmm. as well, which is very much depending now uh, as well on China, South Korea, Japan. In our hotels which we have there, we have over 30% of our clients are Chinese clients. 10% are uh, South Koreans, 5% Japanese. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's an amazing city as well now and uh, as well, we are implementing uh, back the gambling areas uh, in, in Russia. So, for example, Vladivostok, we have all our Asian clients coming now. Instead oh, yeah. of going to 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 go or to, uh, to to the US, they are coming over to Vladivostok. And uh, the government is uh, was as well smart enough as well to give uh, uh, for those areas people can come and have no visa for nine days. And That's I can tell you, people are stay staying a long time until the last day uh, to gamble there. <laughs> Try to get their money back. <laughs> no, we keep it. We keep it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. So, Aris, as as I mean, generally we are coming very close to to the end of of our panel since we have not so much time left. So, c can you maybe just give what is the perspective of being hotelier in Greek, as is currently, and what is your opinion about the outlook? Okay. Well, as I said earlier, the the market is doing well from a market perspective. Uh, the trends are upwards, particularly in the internationally accessible destinations. Um, and this shows in various KPIs like revenues, visitation, etc. From an entrepreneurial perspective, though, there are two major problems. One has to do with uncertainty. And until this and, and uncertainty and finance, which come together, I think they will be resolved together or, or stay around together. Uh, and the other issue at the moment has to do with high taxation. We have the highest VAT among our competitors. And just to give you one example, we've done some calculations for a four-star tour-operated uh, hotel. And 
if we had the tax coefficients of Cyprus, the break-even point would be 16% lower. So that means, you know, you enter much earlier in the market and you leave much later from the market. So these are, so on the one side, the market seems good. On the, if you look, go into the balance sheet and the P&L, the problems have to do with financing and uh, taxation. Mm -hmm. Or to put it in another way, because this is kind of general consulting uh, response, which I really much appreciate since I'm also a consultant. But if you had a personal family fund of 10, 10 million dollars, mm -hmm. would you choose Greek to invest your money or not? Oh, good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, ask the gentleman. <laughs> Where would they take they, their investors? Just <laughs> <laughs> we don't have any money. Well, I think it's. As I said, there are uh, investments taking place at the moment, but the investments are predominantly taking place on, uh, in areas where they, are, uh, they have some sort of dis distinct advantage, you know, or they have a, a, a brand name uh, of their own. So, for example, there are, as I said, there's the case of Athens. I gave you some examples before. There's the case where a mega deal was signed last year which involved the acquisition of a resort brand called San Icos, has my name as well. I have no relationship, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, but uh, that was an acquisition that involved Oak Tree and Goldman Sachs. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's important. And they have an expansion plan with 200 million uh, to build very high end, uh, all inclusive uh, resorts. And they're, they're rolling it out so they will open two hotels which will combine one in Corfu in 2018. They will open another hotel uh, in Kos, and they are actually they started building in October and will be ready by June 1st or May 1st, I can't remember which of the two, with a 150 luxury hotel within a resort, uh, couples only. So, you know, there are investments taking place at both the high end and the smaller uh, size. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, we expect that this would really, will really take off once the, at least the issue of financing is revolved, resolved uh, and the issue of uncertainty. Taxation, lowering of taxation will help, but you know, we don't expect this to happen anytime so, soon. So probably you would choose, maybe. No, Dr. Harris is going to keep uh, his $10 million, I think. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I wish oh. I had it. <laughs> Omer, um, obviously <laughs> coming, from, from Rotana, <laughs> coming from Rotana Hotels, um, Iran is probably not the only target you're aiming at. Uh, can you maybe share, if it's not confidential, what, what other plans you have for Rotana? Yeah, we have exciting Anything plans. for Europe? Uh, yeah, uh, no. I'd love to say yes, but the answer is no. I've been trying for the past couple of years to uh, uh, do some deals here in Europe, but. Uh, the model of Rotana has always been, uh, we're a hotel management company, we sign management agreements. Uh, we, don't, we haven't been into any lease agreements and we have uh, very small pieces of equity in some of our properties. Uh, but um, it's proven now that if you want to move into Europe, you're going to have to play the game uh, of Europe. So we have a few things that we're playing with at the moment in terms of uh, the key cities like London. Uh, and hopefully, hopefully, if all goes well by the end of this year, we might be able to announce something. But other places that we're very uh, heavy into is Africa. Uh, we opened up mm -hmm. Congo uh, uh, a couple of months ago. We have Dar es Salaam opening up very soon, uh, Lagos, um, and Marrakesh in the north, and, it's, and Turkey. Turkey is another one for us. So, you know, whilst we're very strong in our Middle East and uh, Middle Eastern region, we're now starting to branch out into these regions, which are, you know, very close to us, so that we can quickly manage them and, uh, and service them uh, in the way that we promise the owners. So, um, I'd love to say that we have something coming up in. Uh, in London and Madrid and Barcelona and Paris, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's becoming a little bit difficult. So I need people like you, uh, Sunita, to help me out, Mr. Consultant, uh, that can bring some good deals to me, <laughs> all right? And now sure, maybe, I'll have a, maybe I'll have a chat with George afterwards. Maybe we could do a deal I, I, I as well. Think, so. <laughs> I like the 50% I think three well. of us, we could grab a coffee after yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. After. yeah, yeah. But, uh, but uh, yeah, so those are the places that we're growing into mainly. Okay, very good. Well. Fingers crossed, and let's see. Thank you. Thank you. I wish you all the luck. Um, so, George, um, obviously, being small country, 
between big countries around Russia, Iran on the south, Turkey on the on the east, uh, on the west. Um, it's not probably quite easiest job to be in your position to market Georgia on the global <coughs> on the global touristic market. So can you tell us what what is how is Georgia planning to compete on the global market over the next few years? Uh, luckily for us, Georgia is a uh, very diverse country. For example, we have even different climate zones from subtropical to semi-desert. We have different regions and uh, we have seaside coasts, Black Sea, and we have mountains, we have wine region. So everybody can find uh, its own reason to come to Georgia. All the countries you have mentioned uh, are one of the top countries who are visiting us. Uh, we are not only competing with them, but we have the biggest traffic uh, of tourists from Turkey, from Russia. Russia is number one by the tourists. Um, uh, from neighbors like Armenia, Azerbaijan, and also from the Iran. Uh, we, make, uh, we made uh, visa free with Iran, and we are receiving uh, a huge number of tourists who are coming to Georgia. So uh, GCC, another important re uh, region for us, because it's only two and a half hours flight and the uh, nature is absolutely different and tourist product is absolutely different. What we did with GCC, we gave uh, visa free also to the residents of the old GCC countries. It allowed us to get more and more people who are not uh, uh, citizens of those countries, mm -hmm. but uh, they uh, live there and uh, they have a salary insurance and a job or small business there. So we do a lot of activities. Uh, we also promote uh, the different uh, air, air companies and support them to start operations towards uh, Georgia. Uh, for example, Germany, we have a Three new flights only in, opened in September 2016 by low-cost airline Vizair, which has already the base in one of the cities in Georgia. So mm -hmm. we do uh, our activities to make uh, Georgia more popular in different countries, including the uh, European Union. Okay. Sounds like a good plan. Thank you. And uh, Walter, the same question more or less like I put to, to Aris. 10 million private family fund, question of investing in Russia, yes, no? Clearly, yes. Clearly, yes. Clearly, <laughs> you started yes. clearly, yes. I believe in Russia. I'm already, uh, since 25 years, connected with, with the country. Uh, part of my family is from Russia. Yes, definitely. I would invest it, and I would trust as well that the money would be as well uh, increasing over the time. Definitely. Okay, so this is quite clear signal from your side. But the same like Ari, I would like to have the 10 millions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so maybe, maybe we should see whether there are any questions from our audience. If, if you have any questions, please raise your hands to any of our panelists here. I'm quite sure they would be very happy to answer if you have any questions. So, yes, no, nothing. Okay, then I guess we answered all the questions for those who are here. Gentlemen, thank you very much for participating, for sharing your inputs with us, and uh, thank you all for being here. Hope you enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.